Good morning, everyone. I know it's not Christmas, but Merry Christmas. <laughs> ah, it's so Christmassy in here, I have to say it. Uh, well, my name is Tiffany, and my husband Elliot and I have the great honor of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church, and I love being here every Sunday. I really, really do. I really do. I think it's so much fun. I see your faces. Even if there's stuff going on, just coming in and seeing your faces brings me joy. And you know what? That's why we come together every Sunday morning, because Welcome for tuning in online. Hello. I'm saying hi to you. And I'm saying we could just tune in online. And that's excellent. I know that happens. But there's something powerful that happens when you're going through something and you come together and there's just joyful, happy people around you. It's such an encouragement when the church comes together. So uh, happy to be with you all today. Uh, We are in a series this morning called This Changes Everything. Yes. Uh, And it it is about Christmas. (laughs) Uh, So this changes everything. And the big idea behind this series is that Christmas time, the most traditional time of the year, was brought on by the greatest change the world has ever seen, which is so interesting because the greatest change the world has ever seen brought in the most tradition that we, every year, Christmas is the same every year. You know, the, the toys go out on the shelf, and then the Christmas stuff comes out. We have our Christmas traditions. We make our Christmas bread. We make our Christmas cookies. We buy our Christmas gifts. Like, everything is the same. Uh, but it was brought on by the greatest change the world has ever seen, and it was new life. Um, and so what I want to, what we're going to talk about during this, this series, but this morning, is how Jesus changes everything. And so in the middle of all our tradition and the things that, that we fall prey to, if you will, and every every year Jesus changes everything. So if you will, it's reinviting Jesus into the most traditional time of the year. Uh, Jesus changes everything. That's what I want to talk about this morning. And it's his grace. We're going to look at his grace. So if you do have your Bibles with you, uh, you can go ahead and get ready and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, If you don't have uh, a paper Bible, that's okay. We will have things up on the screens. We'll have the scriptures. And uh, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, I know there's so many Bible apps out there, but if you have the YouVersion one, we do post events that you can follow along with the events and the notes. So you can pull that up. And then we do have bulletin inserts that have the sermon notes on there. So there are lots of ways that you can engage with the scripture, take notes, write, let the Lord speak to you. Um, our main scripture, which will be up on the screens, is out of Isaiah. We'll get to Ephesians later. Just look that up and hold that, hold that place. Our main scripture for this series is out of Isaiah chapter 43, verses 14 and 15, which I'll read to you. But first, I want to pray. Father, we invite you into this moment, into this time. Lord, we've already had conversations with you. We've already offered you our praise and our worship, and we know that you're present. But right now, Father, I ask uh, and I surrender my ears and my, and my hands and my eyes and my mind, everything that I am, Lord, I surrender to you in this moment. Lord, and I invite you to come and speak to me personally. Lord, would you minister to me? Would you minister to my heart? Would you meet me right where I am and give me a word for this morning? In the name of Jesus, amen. If you agree with that, say amen, church. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah, church is fun. Okay, uh, Isaiah, all monotone. Uh, Isaiah 43, 15 and 19. This is, uh, the Lord is talking to the prophet Isaiah. So God is talking to the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah is speaking to the whole group of Israel. And uh, I'm just setting this up for you. What is happening here is God is calling the people to remember the past. So he's saying, hey, let me get your attention. Let's go back. So he's taking it back. He says this, I am the Lord, your holy one. Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters. He's talking about their past. Making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. So God gets their attention and he says, look back and remember who I am. And then when he has their attention and they've remembered who God is, he says, now look forward because I'm going to do something new. He says, forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And I want to just point out for a minute that when that scripture was spoken, the the nation of Israel was in turmoil. So he wasn't talking to a peaceful nation. It was like, 
uh, I'm going to get, I'll talk about my personal story, but for a second, I just want to set this up. When all the emotions, all the feels are going on, you're angry, you're stressed out, you're upset, you're happy, you're joyful, you're confused, all the feels, all the emotions are happening, and that's when God said, hey, remember the past, remember who I am, and then keep your eyes on me and look forward to the future. So in the middle of emotion, in the middle of feeling, in the middle of confusion, God is present and he is speaking. And so we want to look at his grace in the middle of life, in the middle of stuff. And so that that scripture says, um, let's go back, Isaiah, he says, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And you know what happened last Sunday? Because we use this scripture. It's the theme scripture. You hear it every week while we're in this series. Pastor Elliot was preaching, and I was sitting front row, and that scripture, he said it, and I was like, man, I could use a river in the wasteland right now. <laughs> That's what I thought last week when I was sitting here. I was like, man, I could... I could use that. That's good. That's good. Uh, so if you find yourself in a similar place this morning, you're in good company. You're in good company. So I just want to set that up. Um, in, as 2018, this year, as this year is coming to an end, myself and the other pastors who serve here at Lifeline, uh, we're busy planning and preparing for next year. So we're looking at, what do we have, like four weeks left until 2019 hits? I don't know why we make a big deal of the new year, but we do, and so we got to make a big deal about it. Anyway, but as 2018 is coming to a close, we are looking forward to 2019. And so what we're doing as the pastors on staff behind the scenes, we're planning the calendar. Whoa. We're, uh, we're looking, and uh, we've been doing this for a while, but we really put the pedal to the metal at the end of the year, and we set up the next year. So we're looking forward, and we're planning, uh, putting events on the calendar like prayer and fasting. Shocking that we have to pencil that in, but we value prayer and fasting, and we found that if we don't put it on the calendar, it doesn't happen. We won't do it. And so if we want to have encounters with the Lord and that time where we're actually engaging, we've got to put it on the calendar. We've got to look ahead and we've got to make preparations for it and get ready to have that encounter with the Lord. So we're looking ahead. We've got prayer and fasting on the calendar starting in January. Coming up in a couple weeks, we'll have more information on that. But we're putting events on the calendar. We're considering, Lord, what events are we going to do next year where we're going to reach out to the community and we're going to have Lifeline be a part of, of giving back. Uh, we're looking at equip classes. What equip classes are we going to offer? Life groups. Who's going to be leading life groups? And how are we going to be generating relationships so people are connecting? And so all this stuff is happening behind the scenes. Uh, and we're, you know, we're looking at Sundays. And at the end of the year, we really put a lot more. We do this all year long. But at the end of the year, there's a lot more effort and a lot more time that goes into doing that. Um, and so just last week, I found myself feeling slightly overwhelmed if you will, by the weight of stuff that I felt like was pressing down. Have you ever felt like things are just pressing in around you and they're pressing down on top of you? Um, and that's, that's kind of how I felt. I felt overwhelmed. And as I'm saying this, you're probably thinking, what do you mean? Pastors just preach on Sundays. <laughs> I think Pastors, I think we either have the most easy job in the world, so people think, or we have the most vague job in the world. What do you do? You say you do things, but what do you do, really? Uh, and every day is different, so that's a good question. Uh, but that's really when I was, that's okay. People can think what they want to about what pastors do. But the truth of the matter is, is that God has called my husband and I to pastor, to lead, to shepherd his people. And there's a great responsibility with that. So as we look towards the beginning of the year and there's pressure and we put the pedal to the metal and we get everything set up, it's because we're setting up his people. We're looking forward in preparation and saying, okay, God, where are you? You taking your people, let us get prepared so we can lead our, your people where you want to take them. Um, and so it, it's good, and it's a good thing. Um, but at this, this year particularly, I found myself feeling more burdened or pressed down than I really ever have before. I don't think I've ever, I've ever felt as burdened or as pressured as I did um, this year. And so when I was sitting there, this happened last Sunday, and the, the scripture said, I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And I was like, man, I, I, could, I could use that. Um, cause, and then he, he called me back. I was sitting there, and he said, I, I'm going to create rivers in the dry wasteland. And I thought, man, I could really use that. And then the Lord brought me back to when I was standing in my kitchen, like earlier in the week, uh, and I was feeling burdened and pressures. Uh, 
where I had all the things. Let's let's talk about this. I had all the things on my list. I got my phone. I didn't bring it up here. But I have a to-do list on my phone because if I don't write things down, I'll forget to do them. Like, I'll have a good idea. I need to do this. If I don't write it down, it doesn't happen. So on my trusty, dusty phone has a widget. And on the widget, I posted it, like, right on my home screen. So if I open my home screen, bam, to-do list. It's the first thing I see, which is good when you're trying to be productive. And it's not good when you're feeling overwhelmed. Because then you just keep looking at the list. And the list isn't going away. <laughs> so sometimes I've done this. When I was on vacation, I turned the widget off. I was like... I'm, it's my vacation. I'm not doing this. Get it, get out of here. Um, but when I look at that, I, I remember I was staying there, and it was like my kids were um, over here. I'm in the kitchen. I do work in the kitchen because I do most of my work at home unless I have to be here at the office. And so I stand at the kitchen counter because that is where my kids they just will leave me alone if I stand there. I have two tiny humans. If I sit on the couch, they want to sit with me and they want to bang on the keyboard. Have you ever tried to Have you ever tried to do work and your kid is we went oriental all of a sudden, I feel like. Oh, I thought that was coming out of the speakers. <laughs> it wasn't coming out of the speakers. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, I do, I do my work at the kitchen counter because that's where, that's where I can focus. My kids will play, and they'll, they'll for, for the most part, do what they need to do. Um, and when I was standing there, so the Lord's reminding me of all this stuff, and I remember my kids were laughing and having fun, and they wanted me to engage with them. And I looked over at them, and I literally had to think, like, I don't know if I have time to laugh right now. Whoa. Have you, so it was like, <clears throat> I could use a river in the wasteland. I, I didn't know if I had time to laugh because I'm looking at my list, and I've got things going on. And this, the, this most traditional time of year where we celebrate the greatest change, we also typically find the greatest pressure on our lives. It's where if anything has happened during the year, and I think a lot of times I brought tissue up. I was prepared this, this morning. Um, but this time of year, there is so much emotion attached to this season because it's, it's fun and we celebrate. But at the same time, we know loved ones have been lost and we know it's the end of the year. And so just all the things, they tend to come up at this most traditional time of year where we celebrate the greatest changes the world has ever, ever seen all the feels come up, and it can be difficult to process that. And so I want to talk about God's grace this morning and the hope that he brings in this season. Um, God says, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And sometimes those, those feelings of being overwhelmed, if you find yourself there this season. If not, that's okay. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you have joy and peace and there's no sense of that because you're, you're better. It's good. That's great. Um, but if you find yourself there, it can feel like a wilderness or a wasteland. Pressure and being overwhelmed, it feels like a wilderness or a wasteland where you feel the feelings are alone and isolation um, and just anxiety, fearful. And the Lord spoke to me and said, he said, I have already done this. I've, I've already created a river in the wasteland. You never need to feel dehydrated or anxious because I have come and I'm here. And so we're in the Christmas season. Trees are up. The lights are on. Everything is decorated. The lights are put up on the houses. Presents are being bought. We went on, me and Elliot went on a date last Friday, and we bought a bunch of Christmas presents. Uh, so presents are being bought. Parties are starting. There's, there's parties happening. Um, and the stress and the pressure to have enough, to be enough, and to feel loved is setting in among everybody. And so Isaiah, the scripture I read, is out of the Old Testament. And so that scripture was looking forward to the future, to the coming of Jesus. And we know that he came because the most traditional time of the year, the time that brought the greatest change is what we celebrate, is what we are celebrating. Jesus came. And the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Bible tell the story of Jesus coming. And when it says a pathway will be made in the wilderness, that was John the Baptist. If you read, it's John the Baptist. He came and he prepared the way. And he sent him, God sent him ahead of Jesus to prepare the hearts of the people. And then Jesus came as a baby. And this is fun. He was raised by nobodies in nowhere according to God's plan. A river appeared in the dry wasteland. That's what he came into. And it is celebrating this remembrance, the remembrance of Jesus coming Christmas. 
a river appearing in the dry wasteland that sends so many of us in our nation into frenzy and depression. And if not depression, because I know depression is a real thing. I'm not making light of that. I know it's a real thing, We're, and, and that's okay. But if, if you don't find yourself actually depressed, then perhaps you find yourself being dissatisfied or finding yourself striving a little bit more in this season, feeling overwhelmed, which is where I found myself. I found myself feeling overwhelmed and striving. And the Lord said to me, I have created a river in the wasteland. I have created a place where you can feel loved and where you don't have to feel overwhelmed. It's found in my son. And he says, you don't have to feel this way because I have come. I am here. And the Lord reminded me of two other scriptures while he was, while he was kind of speaking to me. And it was John 4, 14 and John 7, 37, which I'll read to you. So John 4, 14 says this. Jesus is talking and he says, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And then John 37, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And so Jesus says to people who believe in him, I'm one of those people. If you believe in Jesus, then you are one of those people. And Jesus says, rivers of living water will flow from within you, from within us. Now, last week when, when I was sitting there, I felt overwhelmed. I felt pressed in on the sides. I, pressed, you know, I felt pressed down from the top. I, like I said, I was struggling to laugh and just be silly because I didn't know if I had, this is stupid, I didn't know if I had time in my schedule to just have fun. Like, what kind of life is that? I value fun. If I don't have fun in my life, something's wrong. Um, but it happens. And so in, those, in, the, in, that, mo in that moment, in those, all the feelings, God met me there, and he reminded me of what he has done for me. He said, I have created a river in the wasteland. He said, rivers of living water will flow from within you. Uh, and what happened is right there in that moment, God opened my eyes and he opened my heart and he showed me that I wasn't believing in Jesus. Now, I don't mean that I had stopped believing in God and like I wasn't, you know, I'm not going to heaven anymore because I, you know, I didn't renounce God. I didn't renounce Jesus. But he said, you have put You've become distracted. This is what he told me. In all my feelings, in all my feelings of feeling overwhelmed and all this stuff, he said, hey, you made yourself stressed out. That's what he told me. He said, you put all this pressure on yourself to do these things, and you got distracted. That's what he told me. He showed me, this is fun, he showed me that I had placed more value on things being done and I had placed more value on being praised by him and by other people for my hard work ethic than I had just found value in being his child. So remember, I have my to-do list, my big, long to-do list. I'm standing at the kitchen counter, and I have real work. It's real work that needs to be done, and there are time frames, and there are deadlines, and so there's got to be a priority there. But what happened is, is I had put far much too, I had put way too much value in those things being accomplished than I had in just God delights in me. Um, and so I didn't feel like I had streams of water coming out of me. I felt like I needed to retreat and find water because I wasn't going to make it. Have you ever found yourself there where you have so much going on that you just you need to pull back because there's way too much and there's no way you're going to be able to accomplish it all? And Jesus right there says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've put rivers of living water in you. You should never have to pull back. And so if we find ourselves at a, this is what he told me, if you find your, yourself at a place where you need to pull back, then you do need to slow down and reevaluate where your values are. Because I'd put my value in being, not being a sluggard, <laughs> in actually getting work done. But this is, this is huge because God in his great mercy and love, and, and love he rebuked me. That's a strong word. He rebuked me for finding my value in work or productivity rather than finding my value from being his child. And when I'm talking about this, I absolutely completely understand that it is bizarre 
and really hard to wrap our minds around how do I find value in being God's child because I only feel worth it when I'm doing something. It's really hard, and that's our culture. It's, it's the culture that we live in, our surroundings, uh, and so I get that. But I want to talk to us this morning about how Jesus changes everything. Our surroundings and our culture, they feed us the lie that happiness and joy and really having fun is found in stuff. And I think it's amplified in the Christmas season. All year long, we put our joy, we find joy, we find peace, we find happiness, and we look back and we say, man, look at what I did. I did all that. I provided all that. My family has all this because of the work I did. And so all year long, that's where we find our value from. But at Christmas time, it's amplified. We need to produce more stuff. We need to provide more stuff. We need to be more creative. I've, not everybody, but a lot of people in this season, all the feelings we have all year long are amplified. And then when we look back and say, look what I did, look what I did, look what I did, at this time of year, it tends to fall short. And it's because God is stirring things. If Jesus is the reason for the season, and we've taken our eyes off of Jesus and putting them on stuff, something feels off in, in ourself. And so Jesus is the reason we celebrate the season. And he says joy and peace and fun are found in me. And so if we have our eyes off of him, we miss joy and we miss peace and we miss fun. Uh, last week, Pastor Elliot told a story about how our youngest son, Evan, really likes to help around the house. He really does. He, that hard work ethic and initiative, he has got it. And not only does he have it, he wants us to know that he has it. He will, you know, because Ellie was telling the story about how Evan likes to help with the laundry. He doesn't want to just help with the laundry. He wants to see, he wants you to see him helping with the laundry. He will get your attention. Dad, 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 mommy, mom, mom. And then once he has your attention, then he does the thing. And when he does the thing, then he looks at you like, praise me. Praise me, man. Praise me, woman. You know, so we're, good job, Evan, good job. Um, but Ellie, and so Elliot, we love his drive. We love his initiative. We love that he likes to work hard and, and he wants to be a productive member of society. That's great. But what really, at two, um, but what really brings us joy, what, what Elliot said, what really brings him joy is when Evan just wants to sit with him. When, when Evan doesn't, doesn't want to be praised for his work, but he just wants to sit with daddy, that's, that's when there's the most joy. That's when there's the most peace. That's when the most love is felt between father and son. And father God is no different. Because we do the same thing. God, 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 look, see what I did. See what I did. See what I did. And of course, we have a loving father in heaven. And so he says, wow, good job. I see that you did that. You know, the, when you're two and you put a sock on the bed, like, that's great, son. <laughs> That's great, daughter. And I mean, the Lord really does take joy and delight in that. But when we just want to sit with Father God, when we find our joy and our peace and our value, not in trying to please God, but just in being and inviting him into every situation, that's when the most joy and the most peace and the most love are experienced. That's when we have fun. And I'm not saying it's bad to work hard. If you read the book of Proverbs, I mean, it's kind of clear, don't be lazy. That's what he says. He says, look at the ant who never takes a break. Uh, and I'm not saying don't take a break. Breaks are good too. There are so many things in scripture. So you need to read all of scripture and know all the things. That's impossible. Um, I'm not knocking work. But if we find our value in work and not in God, then we have become distracted. And we will feel overwhelmed. And we will, we will feel burdened because we put our, our, our joy, our value, our peace in the wrong place. So... We're getting to the grace part. So if you've opened to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and we're going to read that right now. And this is what it says. It says, <clears throat> first of all, Jesus changes everything. And it is through Jesus that we experience God's grace. So I want to talk about grace. And it's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So the word grace, I have heard grace forever because I grew up in the church and grace is by grace, grace, grace. There's songs about grace. People talk about grace and I'm like, okay, grace, grace. It's not the same as mercy. It's different. 
I was like, what, what is grace then? So th this time when I was looking, this scripture, when it says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Now, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. That's the, that was the written language of the time. So in, in Greek, the word, I'm going to butcher it because I don't speak Greek, and you're supposed to it. Uh, and it's charis or something like that. It looks like charis, but it's not. And, but, it, but this is what it means. It is by joy. Oh, it means that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, or sweetness. So if we were to rephrase this scripture, it says it is by joy, it is by pleasure, it is by delight, it is by sweetness that you have been saved through faith. And it, the rest of the, the scripture says this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So I looked up the gift of God. Okay, well, what's, what's the, what is gift? What does it actually mean? And it actually means present. It is a present and so to, to rephrase the whole scripture, it is by joy, it is by pleasure, it is by delight, it is by sweetness that you have been saved through faith. Faith, And this is not from yourselves, it is a present from God. Because of Jesus, and this is, I'm going to kind of, it is because of Jesus that we can experience God's joy, God's pleasure, and God's delight. The Christmas season, the most traditional time of the year where we get into our ruts and we do our things and all that kind of stuff, God is saying, I gave you a present. I gave you Jesus so that you could have my joy and my peace and my delight and my sweetness. So if you're not experiencing God's delight or God's joy or God's sweetness, then can I invite you to remember the present this morning, which was Jesus. And that's what the Lord did for me. There's another scripture. It's uh, Romans. It's a cross-reference. So a cross-reference is a scripture that says the same thing. It's another scripture in the Bible that says the same thing in a different way. So the cross-reference for that scripture is Romans 3.23. And it says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified that word justified means made right. All are made right freely, which means without a cause, by his grace or by his joy, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So I'm going to paraphrase that scripture again. Justified is made right. Freely is without a cause, and by his grace is by his joy or by his delight. So it says this, you are made right without a cause, in vain, freely, by his delight, by his joy, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we are made right because God is joyful and not because we did something right, not because we could produce enough or whatever. Uh, God gave his son Jesus as a present. So when, when uh, I was thinking about this, um, okay, I need you to think, maybe you don't have a person in your life like this. I'm not sure if I do. But think about someone, if you do, or just imagine it, Someone who is just extremely grumpy. We could go Ebenezer Scrooge. We could go that route. Um, but just an extremely grumpy person. Like they're always negative. Uh, they never have anything good to say. And whenever they talk to you, they've, they've got something wrong with you. Like they will point out all your flaws. And they will be grumpy, and you can never make them happy. Like, think of, if you've got a person like that, think of them. Or just imagine a person like that who's so grumpy, who's so negative, who's so life-sucking. They suck the life right out of the room, okay? And then imagine that uh, you, let's imagine now that you, in contrast, are so full of love and of joy that you are unaffected by their bad attitude. Like, and I don't mean it's, it's not like you don't see the bad attitude. It's not like you're pretending it's not there. You see it, and you're so full of joy that you can see over it. You can see through it. You know that they've got stuff, and so they're grumpy, but their grumpiness doesn't affect you. You can still love them even though they're the worst, okay? Like, think about it. And so this, this was the image. And then it was like, now you... They're grumpy. They're the worst. They're the worst person you know, and they're so grumpy. And you're not being uh, better than, and you're not, you're not ignoring the situation, but you're loving them over their grumpiness, over their being the worstness. And so this is, this, is the fun, this is the fun part. You love them enough that even though they're grumpy and they hate everything, you know there's something that they'll like. 
and you go to the store and you buy it for them and you wrap it up or you put it in a bag and you take this, this beautiful gift and you're so full of joy and then you give it to the grump. And this is the fun part. You know the grump is going to hate it because they're grumpy. They're going to be like, why'd you give me this? What's this for? What do I owe you? You know what I mean? Like they're that person. And then they open it and you know they really like it, but they're like, Ugh. you know, and then they, they find something wrong with it. Well, that's good, but it's the wrong, you know, it's the wrong color. It's the wrong size or I'm going to take it back because I don't really need it. Whatever it is, whatever it is, they're so grumpy. Okay. But here's the fun part. You're so full of joy and you love them. It doesn't even matter if they hate it because you're just so happy. You wanted to give something away anyway. Like, I, I still love you. I think you're the worst, but I still love you. And so I'm going to give you good things because I want to, because I'm not affected by your grumpiness. And I was laughing about that. And I was like, man, I really want to be that person. Wouldn't that be amazing that you're so happy and you're so joyful? Because here's the thing. It's my money, so I'm not going to spend my money on the grump. You know what I mean? Like, they're going to find something wrong with it. But what if we were so happy and we were so joyful and we were so full of life and love that it didn't matter? We'll spend our hard-earned money on the grump, on the worst. And we'll give it to them with joy and with happiness. And I was like, I want to be that person. I don't think I've ever been that person. I really think it'd be amazing but God was like, I did that. That's what I did. Jesus is our present. God gave the worst. I mean, you know what I did? I read a scripture this week that talked about how um, if we're not, we are really prideful if we think there's nothing wrong with us. If we think we have no sin. And this is who I was. I grew up in the church, okay? Uh, and so I don't have a story of drug addiction or alcohol addiction or any kind of promiscuity, all that kind of stuff, it's not in my story. And so as a, when I heard people telling their stories about coming to Jesus and they've got the story and they're so grateful, this is what happened. I would see people get saved and I'd be like, man, they are so excited for Jesus. They are so on fire. They're so passionate. They say yes to everything. Why? And he was, God was like, they've been forgiven of much. They've got much to be excited about. And I was like, I haven't been forgiven of much. How can I be that excited? And this is what he said to me. He said, yes, you have. He said, because you are prideful. And if you will let go of your pride, you will have much to be joyful for. You will have much to celebrate. And so it was even in whatever your story is, there is so much to be joyful for. We have been forgiven of much. And God says, so it doesn't matter if you're the perfect Christian kid. You've got sin. <laughs> and if you let the Lord highlight your sin, then you'll become joyful and grateful and be able to give good things to other people and to receive the good gift that is Jesus Christ, that grace that we received because of what, of what Christ did for us. And so um, this, is, this is God is not put off by our stressed out self. God is not affected by our bad attitude when we're under pressure. When I'm under pressure, I kind of have a bad attitude. Maybe you're better than me. Maybe you are. <laughs> um, God doesn't pull away from us when we pull away from him. Instead, what he does is he leans forward and he says, remember the gift. Remember the present. In this season where everything is amplified and we feel the pressure to have enough, to be enough, to provide enough, he says, remember the present. Remember the present. Joy and peace and happiness are not found in your stuff. They're not found in your ability to produce stuff, in your ability to provide stuff, in your ability to have stuff. Your joy and your peace and your happiness come from remembering the present. Remember the present. Remember the gift that Christ Jesus gave. Um, and so um, this time of year, what I think is really funny, is every year at the same time, Every year at the same time, the most traditional time of year, we are tempted by the enemy with the same tactics to become deceived and enslaved by passions and pleasures. Every year at the same time. The enemy employs the same tactics. Yet God's people who are celebrating the greatest gift the world has ever seen, Jesus Christ, to get their eyes off of Jesus and onto stuff. Every year, same time. Every year, same time, same stuff. Every year. Think about it. Think about it. Every year, same time, same stuff. 
get God's people to get their eyes off of Jesus and onto stuff. Their ability to provide stuff, their ability to produce stuff, their ability to have stuff. In the most traditional time of year, we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, and yet our eyes are off of Jesus and on stuff. Anybody? 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 And so if you find yourself this morning to be in the same place I was, eyes off Jesus, eyes on stuff, eyes on producing stuff, creating stuff, 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 eyes on productivity, eyes off Jesus, eyes on productivity, whatever it is, I invite you like the Lord invited me, remember his grace. Remember the present. Remember Jesus. It is by joy, by pleasure, by delight that we have been safe, saved. And it is the present. It is the person of Jesus. Uh, Jesus changes everything. He's, God is happy. God is joyful. God takes delight in you, not because you have stuff, not because you produce stuff, because he loves you. And he loves when you produce things, but he loves you more than your productivity. And he, he wanted to make us right with him so that we could sit with him, like when Evan sits with Elliot. He wanted to make us right so we could sit with him so that he could impart his joy into our life, that ability to give good things to the worst. He wants that in us. That's why he gave us Jesus. A part of the reason why he gave us Jesus is so that we could have the joy and give to the worst. So this is it. I have one application. It's the most simple application ever in the world, and it's this. We're going to build on last week's application. Last week's application was the first 15. Spend five minutes in prayer, spend five minutes reading the Word, and spend five minutes in worship. In the first 15, find something to be thankful for. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, and say, God, I give you... I, I thank you for today. I thank you that you woke me up. And I, when I was talking about it's difficult to be God's child, you can use words. Say, Father, you sit there, and you say, Father, I, I know that you're present with me. I can't see you, and right now I don't feel you, but I invite you to, to speak to me, to be with me. I, Father, I want to feel your love in this moment. I want to experience your presence. So at the beginning of my day, I give you today, and here's the thing, because I have my to-do list, my widget on my phone. Father, you tell me what I do today. Give your to-do list to God and say, do I need to do all of this, or can I do less? And then uh, here we go again. Take um, When you start to feel stressed out in the middle of the day because you remembered him in the beginning, but then you went and did your own thing anyway. Uh, anybody? Nobody? Um, so when you, when you went and did your own thing anyway in the middle of the day and you begin to feel stressed out or overwhelmed and like there's no joy, there's no peace, in that moment, in those feelings, stop for a second and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus, I give, you, I, give you, I give you back my day. I'm stopping and I'm giving you my day back. And then what you do is say, how do I proceed with the rest of my day? And you know what's amazing? is because I'll have my list of things that I want to do in a day. And when I get stressed out and I give him the list, he's like, hey, Tiff, you've got an extra 20 minutes on Thursday that you forgot about. So why don't you move this over there? And it's amazing how simple that is. But when we invite God into our to-do list, he like organizes it to where we can have peace and joy and fun in the middle of the list. And so it's okay to have the list. It's okay to have the productivity. It's okay to have the things. But in your first 15, say, how do I organize, how do I organize these things? And then at the end of the day, when you're looking forward to tomorrow and you're making your other lists, your tomorrow list, remember the Lord and go to bed grateful and thankful because you'll wake up so much more relaxed and so much more at peace if you went to bed grateful rather than going to bed stressed out about tomorrow. Amen? So let's go ahead and pray. Uh, every head down, every eye closed. Now, this message wasn't intended to bring shame to anyone who feels under pressure or anyone who's striving or struggling or, or really working hard just because you're working hard to make ends meet, and it happens to be the Christmas season. And so what I want to do right now with every head bowed and every eye closed 
if you felt yourself feeling any kind of shame or condemnation because you're busy, then what I want to do is I want to come against the work of the enemy and those thoughts. And so in the name of Jesus, I command those thoughts of shame or condemnation to be silenced right now. I shut those thoughts up those thoughts up in the name of Jesus and I command them to be silent and instead Father I ask that your spirit of truth would come and rest upon your people Father I I ask Lord that that you would highlight the places of, of your people's life Lord where you find joy and you find delight Lord I ask that you would show your light and your joy and your peace Father, in this moment, I ask that you would call to remembrance moments of happiness and moments of joy. Lord, in this moment, I ask, Father, if there are things on the list, things that have been replaying in our mind, or maybe things that have been causing us some stress, Father, that you would bring clarity and clarification um, in how to go about fulfilling those things or accomplishing those things. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask if we have picked up things, if we have put pressure on ourselves, Father, that you haven't asked us to pick up, that if it's pressure that you haven't put on us, in the name of Jesus, I ask for the strength and the humility to let that go, to repent for being prideful or to repent for being too productive and picking things up that you haven't asked us to. Father, in the name of Jesus, if we're if we're sacrificing family, if we're sacrificing love, if we're sacrificing peace, Lord, I pray against condemnation, but I instead release um, a release. Lord, the ability to let go of those things and to find peace and joy in your name. In the name of Jesus, Father, I ask that your peace and your joy and your love and your comfort and your presence would rest upon your people in this moment. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's someone who hasn't given their life to Jesus and you want his joy and his peace, you feel like you're striving and you've never had a release from that, then I want to give you the opportunity to encounter the Lord. So if that's you, go ahead and just every eye is closed. You can raise your hand and look at me. I'd love to pray with you so you can invite the Lord into your life to experience that freedom and that hope and that joy. I see your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would everybody just go ahead and pray this out loud with me? Father God. I receive your presence. I thank you for Jesus. I believe that you love me. I believe that joy and hope are found in you. I thank you for your salvation. Father, would you help me remember you in this Christmas season? Father, would you help me slow down in this Christmas season and place your joy within me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I have some next steps for you. Uh, First of all, if if you've recently given your life,